Hey guys, I'm Siobhan, a fourth year medical resident, and tonight I'm bringing you with me to the COVID-19 ICU. Right now, here in Ontario, we've got more cases than ever before, and 90% of those cases are variants that spread quickly. So we're seeing hospitals filling up, and temporary field hospitals are being created by the military. It feels so surreal. I'm actually a little bit nervous for the shift tonight. It's the first shift I've done since the third wave has really taken off. So I'm not totally sure what to expect. So on that note, let's get going. The ICU shift starts with handover, where doctors from the day shift meet with doctors who are starting the night shift. We talk about each patient, their age, date they got COVID, date of the admission, date they were intubated, medications they've received, how much oxygen they're on, and if they've been prone. All the patients have a similar story. Severe COVID-19 infections on life support, fighting to survive. Before I get too busy, I just wanna drop off my stuff in a call room and just get myself organized for the night. Okay, so I've just got a handover about um, all the patients and I'll tell you, the most shocking thing is that it feels like this ICU unit has completely transformed in the past month. Like the, the number of patients, but the type of patients. So they're so much younger. We've got patients in their 20s and 30s, a whole bunch in their 40s and 50s. And then the number of patients is just huge. It's normally just one ICU here. We now have three ICUs. I've heard about four new patients that are coming our way. Two are being transferred from an outside hospital um, because those hospitals are full. And then two look like they've become really sick on the ward and they're gonna get transferred down to have more care in the ICU. So I'm, yeah, I'm just, I'm pretty shocked actually to see the rapid transformation and how different the ICU is. It's, um, it's a little bit scary actually. Yep, just for one more second, if you don't mind. Right. No, no, you're fine. Now it's time for evening rounds with Dr. Alhazani and Brittany, the junior resident who's on call with me tonight. We assess each patient with a bedside nurse and respiratory therapist. Most patients are intubated in a medically induced coma and paralyzed, all in an effort to improve their oxygen levels. But I can't help but smile under my mask as I see one of our youngest patients awake and texting while she's hooked up to the ventilator. That's definitely a good sign. Hello. <laughs> um, right now we're heading to Emerge. Um, we have a patient who's on 100%, so we're a little bit worried about him. Um, yeah. We're gonna divide and conquer. Um, I'll do the notes and- Yeah, let's go this way. Here's orders. a pulse. In the emergency department, we learn more about the patient. He's an essential worker who swabbed positive for COVID a few days ago. When his breathing worsened, his wife called an ambulance. EMS arrived and found his oxygen levels were dangerously low in the 70s. By the time he arrived in the emergency department, he was breathing very quickly and his oxygen levels were persistently low, so he was intubated. Take a look at this chest x-ray compared to a normal chest x-ray. All that extra white is showing inflammation and infection. Now his blood work comes back showing a very high D-dimer level, which raises concern for a blood clot. So I'm ordering a CT scan of the chest to look for a blood clot. Okay, so we just got the results from the CT scan back. And unfortunately this patient has two big problems in the lungs. The first is COVID, COVID pneumonia. We can see the inflammation on both sides of the lungs and it looks pretty bad. The second is unfortunately, he does have blood clots on both sides of the lungs. These are called pulmonary emboli. And we know that with all the inflammation from COVID that blood clots form. So we're gonna treat this patient with anticoagulant. So a blood thinner to help with the blood clots. And then to reduce the inflammation, we're gonna be giving steroids and a medication called tocilizumab. Hey, I just did an ABG on my patient in bed 14. Do you wanna check the gas to see if we're proning him? Oh yeah, absolutely. We can do a simple calculation called the PF ratio to estimate the patient's lung damage. So we compare the amount of oxygen in the patient's blood to the amount of oxygen that we're giving them. The more damage and inflammation there is in the lungs, the more difficult it is for the oxygen to move from the alveoli into the bloodstream. 
Okay, Jen, so I was just looking at the PF ratio. Yeah. It looks really bad, and it actually looks a lot worse than previous, okay. so that's definitely prone. Okay. Um, I'll put the order in. Okay. Anything else you need right now? Uh, no, I think that's it. I'll just go try to find some people. Okay, yeah, sounds good. Thank you. Let yes. me know. Okay. Proning a patient means you flip them over so they are lying on their stomach. It's a technique that we use for patients who are struggling to get enough oxygen despite being on a ventilator. We do it because when you're lying on your back, gravity causes the back of the lungs to partially collapse, which is called atelectasis. Gravity also pulls more fluid into that area, making it difficult for oxygen to pass through the lungs. By flipping a patient onto their stomach, the back of the lungs can then expand, which improves lung compliance and oxygenation. And all this happens while the patient is in a medically induced coma and paralyzed. What actually do you do when you're proning a patient? So it's a lot more labor intensive than what would, one would think flipping someone onto their stomach is like. Uh, so it takes at least four nurses and one respiratory therapist wow. at minimum to flip them over safely. And in terms of safety, it's, uh, it's a matter of keeping their breathing tube in the correct place during the entire turn. Uh, same with their keeping their IVs in place. And oftentimes these IVs are running what is considered life support for the patients. Yeah. And they can have upwards of eight, 10 IV separate lines going at a time. So it's, it's a matter of sort of keeping everything intact and not pulled out on the flip over, which is often a challenge. Most times patients that are proned onto their stomach are paralyzed, so they don't have that same awareness that we would have if they're lying on something that would be causing them skin damage or if they're lying in an uncomfortable position. So we take good care in terms of placing pads under certain bony prominences on their body to make sure that there's no excessive pressure on any pressure points and same with taking sort of like a fine tooth comb through their lines and make sure they're not lying on even something as small as like a little IV cap stuck yeah. under their shoulder can cause a huge amount of damage. So yeah. tough. And some of these people are not moving for days and even weeks, which is pretty awful. So trying to take care of them really well. So um, we have a, a new patient is coming in now. Don't tell me it's another eMERGE patient. <laughs> no, not an eMERGE patient, but a transfer from another hospital. Oh, are they here now? Yeah. Okay, yeah. do you wanna go check it out? Yeah, sure. Okay, Sounds let's good. go see. This is a patient in their late 30s who was always healthy until COVID. The patient was transferred from a hospital about one hour away that didn't have any more ICU beds available. We get handover from the EMS and learn that the patient had already been intubated and is requiring high amounts of oxygen. Right now in Ontario, 90% of cases during the third wave are variants, which spread faster and seem to be causing younger patients to get sicker than the original virus. And the lab confirmed this patient has one of those concerning COVID-19 variants. So I just got paged about a patient on the COVID ward who's been here for about 24 hours and whose oxygen requirements have gone from 40% up to 80% in the last 12 hours and apparently is, is struggling a bit to breathe. So I'm gonna go take a look and see how this patient's doing. I wonder if they're gonna have to come down to the ICU. As I walk into the patient's room, I see a middle-aged woman lying on her stomach with an oxygen mask on her face. She's breathing quickly, and she tells me that she feels a lot better lying on her stomach, which is so interesting. So she actually figured out the proning technique that we talked about earlier, all on her own. She's on 100% oxygen now. She's definitely coming to the ICU, and I suspect we're gonna have to intubate her tonight. Um, the sad thing is, you know, her family can't be here because of COVID. Um, so we're gonna get her to Zoom with her family to be able to at least see them and talk to them because she won't be able to talk when she's intubated. And I really hope that she's not saying goodbye to them. It's just, uh, it's so, it's so heavy to think about. I'm sure it's terrifying for her, but I wanted to be able to connect with her family before this all happens. So hopefully we can transfer her down quickly um, and get all this done. Oh, man, I don't even remember the last thing that I vlogged. It has been such a crazy, oh, last couple of hours. Oh, oh my gosh. At the same time, four patients became hypoxic. They all were, had low oxygen levels for different reasons. One of them had attention pneumothorax, um, another one 
had um, too much thick secretions to be able to aerate well, and the other two have just progressed horribly with their COVID overnight. One of them I really don't think is going to make it. We've called the family to come in. <sighs> My gosh. This is just like a, a marathon of a night. Wow. Okay. I am going to go through the list of all the patients and just kind of recap what's happened with them, make sure I know what's going on, and then, I don't know, we'll see what happens with the last couple of hours of this shift. Hopefully not too much. Um, I will say that I'm so grateful that the hospital has added two ICU staff who are staying in-house in the hospital overnight. Uh, so I was able to call them and get help because it was just too many sick patients all at once. Oh my goodness. Okay. <sighs> wow. You know, I've got to say, like, I am feeling this pandemic fatigue. You know, this third wave, oh, it's not where we wanted to be in the summer. You know, to see higher numbers than ever, patients are sicker, younger, filling the ICUs. Like, this is not what we wanted. And sometimes it feels like we're right back at the beginning again. But then I remember we're not. Because at the beginning, we didn't even have a vaccine. We were struggling to figure that out and what was the way forward. Now we have a vaccine and we just need to get enough people vaccinated so that we have herd immunity, so that life can go back to normal. And I really do believe it will. Unfortunately, I think that things are gonna get a bit worse before they get better, but this is the time when we need to come together as a community. You know, take care of yourself, take care of those around you because we've made it this far and we will get through this. So get vaccinated, keep being safe, keep up the physical distancing. I know it's getting tiring, but we can do this. Anyway, I think at this point I need to go to sleep, but if you wanna see more videos like this, be sure to subscribe. And that way, I'll see you in the next video. So, bye for now.